Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig, and I just wanted to give you an update. Over the last nine months, in large part because of your listener support, we've managed to build this show into one of the top guitar and human interest podcasts online. As a result, we now have openings for a select group of businesses to advertise on and sponsor this show. And I thought you, as a listener, would be in the best position to make recommendations to business owner friends of yours who might benefit from advertising here on the Everyone Loves Guitar Show. So if you know a business owner who might profit from advertising on this show, have them connect with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertising. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertising. I'd love to have a brief conversation with them to see how we might be able to help. Thanks for your help. And now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, we have a really cool guest today. We're with uh, Nier Felder. Nier's a hot new jazz guy in New York. I shouldn't say new. He's the hot jazz guy in New York City. He's definitely not new. He's performed with Chaka Khan, Diana Crawl. Is that, I always mess, is that the right pronunciation for a last name? Crawl? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. John Mayer, Esperanza Spalding, Terry Lynn Carrington, with whom he recorded a Grammy winning single called Money Jungle, Jack DeJanette, Michelle Indege Ocello, that I got right, the New York City Opera, Diane Reeves, Joe Lovano, Snarky Puppy, and we had a bunch of guys from Snarky on the show, Bobby McFerrin, and Liz Wright at venues all over the place, including Radio City Music Hall, The Village Vanguard, on, on and on major national televised programs, including the NBC Christmas Special. Those two venues, by the way, Radio City Music Hall and The Village Vanguard, are iconic, like legendary venues in the city, in New York City. He's also a member of the new co-lead all-star band called Band of Other Brothers with Jeff Coffin, Jeff Babco, Will Lee, and Keith Carlock with a team there. Seeking a more personal creative outlet, Near first formed his own group in 2010, performing shows throughout the United States, Canada, Mexico, Europe, and Asia, following the, re the release of his first solo record called Golden Age. The album was highly touted by the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the New York City Jazz Record, and All About Jazz. Near's currently working on his second solo record, and we'll talk about that today. Near, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, man. Thanks for having me, man. So I just want to get this out of the way. Your last name's Felder. Everybody's going to be wondering, you know, are you related to Don Felder? So just can you clear that? Uh, <laughs> I wish, man. I wish. No relation to Don. No relation to Wilton Felder. That would be pretty cool, but... <laughs> Never met those guys. Never had the, the pleasure. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, you went to Berkeley. What did you study when you were there? I kind of bounced around when I when I got there. Um, I thought I could maybe pull off being a, a composition major. Uh, so I, I I was a classical composition major for a little while, and then I was a jazz composition composition major for a little while, and then I just really wanted to play. Um, at that time, you know, when I was young, I I, I just needed to learn how to how to play better because i always wanted to do that as well and it was too much to do it all so yeah that's probably I, a good lesson to learn early on at that age that you know it's too much to do it all you know it's one day at a time sort of thing you know a lot from those classes but you know it was my focus was still like i, I need to practice i need to have the time to learn how to play my instrument so that when i get out of school i can kind of piece together some sort of a career um, and, and make, make a living or in a living get by at first. So I, I knew that I needed that time. It would have been great to, to get, you know, a little more deep into the classical composition thing, conducting and all that stuff. But I just needed to play. Oh, I hear you. But meanwhile, you've got a, one album out and you have a ton of material recorded in the books from a composition standpoint. Where did you I mean, that's a lot of stuff that you've got that you've written and recorded how did yeah. that did you did you find that hard or no i always liked writing writing was something that always kind of um i don't want to say it was, it's ever been easy but it's it's kind of i have some sort of process for it where i think that you know i can i can write these tunes that are in one way or another kind of unique-ish um they're a little weird and they're a little quirky so i've always had fun doing that hmm. uh the recording is another thing altogether you know i'd probably have a lot more albums out if i was faster at that but you know, just getting things sounding the way I want them to sound. That takes me longer. But the writing is something I've always dug. That's cool. 
Um, talk about your experience working with a band of other brothers because it's a hell of a lineup. I was curious how you hooked up with these guys. That's a cool group of guys, man. Uh, so that's really funny. That's all uh, owed to, to Jeff Babco's genius. And, and Jeff is a great pianist in L.A. He's the pianist on The Kimmel Show and also plays with James Taylor and Martin Short and Steve Martin and a ton of other guys. And he's just a great, hilarious dude. And um, I knew Jeff pretty well from – you know, playing gigs with him and working with him. And I knew Keith pretty well uh, from playing with him in New York. But And Will and I knew each other, but we had never played. Uh, I had never met Jeff Coffin. And I think everybody in the band kind of had a similar relationship with all the other members. Like, they knew most of the guys, but not all the guys, you know. And Jeff kind of just put it together. He kind of envisioned this thing. It's a lot like writing, you know. When I write a tune, I kind of want to know what it sounds like before I, you know start writing it i have an idea or something and then i kind of find a way to make it a reality and it's always a little different than i thought it would be but i think jeff's kind of vision for the band was a little bit like that like he was like okay i want these colors and i want these guys and we had never met all of us all all five of us until we got to the studio that morning in nashville so it was kind of you know off the cuff improvised and super fun um so you record, you all came together. Is there going to be how many? Have you released a record? I mean, how, how many? Yeah, yeah, we, we we have one record out. So we we kind of met in the studio in Nashville uh, one morning two or three years ago, and you know we tracked for three days and then put out a record. And we've been touring as much as we can, but everyone's schedules is yeah, is, you, you know, it's hard to manage. You know, Keith's on the road with Steely Dan, Jeff's out with Dave Matthews Band. You know, everybody's super super busy. So when we find the time. We're trying to play as much as possible, and hopefully there'll be a lot more of that. We really have a good time together. It's, it's a it's a fun band. Yeah, it sounds like it's a, what a just a all star cast there, man. I got to get you a record. I'd love it. Uh, I'll I'll send you one over. Yeah, for sure. Is it jazz? It's jazz. It's jazz. It's, it's funky. You know, um, it, it's on the funky groovy side, but it's definitely jazz, uh, all instrumental, a lot of improvising. So like snarky, I noticed you played with them. Ish, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I know all those guys super well. Um, Radio City Music Hall, man, what was what was it like playing there? Ah, I see, he's smiling ear to ear, man. How could you not? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was fun. That that was a long time ago. I have a lot of funny stories from that that date, but that was like a that was a long time ago. That was a Divas concert with Shaka Khan and Diana Ross and Patti LaBelle and the orchestra. Um, the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra. And also, I uh, played with Bernie Williams, who plays great guitar. Yeah, yeah, because he does a lot of work with Gil. Oh, with Gil Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, so that was fun. That was fun. He, we, it, was, it was, that was pretty, I remember it was pretty off the cuff. We were like, Bernie, what do you want to play? He's like, oh, let's just jam, you know? <laughs> Radio City Music, let's just jam. That's great. So fun. That's let's pretty cool, man. Was it weird talking to him, like, it, no in, man, he is the no no no. I don't mean weird world. like that, but like in you know knowing him, his freaking history as just like one of the you know tr you know modern day great baseball players of the Yankees, and then seeing him, at, and he's an excellent guitarist. What was it like? It, somehow it wasn't intimidating at all because he's like the world's nicest person yeah. and so humble that he makes you feel like you're the star. It's That's really awesome. this weird like reverse. <laughs> he's got going on but he's also which makes it even harder to believe he's enormous like you know yeah, you don't think i know <laughs> baseball players being that big but he's just so tall and so you know such a big dude but he's so sweet so you know he really you know makes it feel like like he's honored to be hanging out with you and i think he does that for everybody because he's just such a nice guy that's cool so, well he probably is genuinely feels like that because i, I mean i think so man. you know his he's probably looking at it that you know he's he was accepted into this, you know, this career, you know, as a second career for him. So he's probably very grateful, you know, and he's probably not thinking about he's just as talented as this as he was in playing baseball. You know, it's just it, a different shift. And, you know, he's he's probably really happy that he has this opportunity to do that. Yeah, well, I think he takes it really seriously. You know, he doesn't seem like he approaches it like a hobby. He approaches no. it like, you know, he goes all in. Yeah, 100 percent, man. <laughs> Uh, so what are you working on now that you're excited about? I know you just came back from Hawaii. That's freaking exciting. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, 
Well, I have I have a ton of music recorded. So I did my last record for Sony Masterworks. It's called Golden Age. It's out there if anybody wants to check it out. And um, uh, I went to record my next one, and I just ended up with a ton of music, and I'm really proud of it. And um, I just have to kind of finish finish the mixing process and then figure out the best way to to release it. Um, I'm hoping they'll still be with Sony. Uh, they did they did an awesome job last time around. So um, that's that's the latest, man. I'm just hard at work at that. Awesome. This is a lot about you that you're a, on a major label. That was cool, man. Yeah. Not a lot of jazz artists get that chance. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. Well, not a lot of people get that chance, jazz or otherwise. It's just, that's true. You know, that's nowadays true. It's, it's changed, as you know. That's you, true. You're in the city now. You grew up there as well? I did, man. What was your childhood like? I did. Like? I stayed close. Uh, my childhood was cool. You know, we moved around a lot, and um, I had parents that both worked. So, like, when I was, whatever, 10 years old or something, uh, my babysitter was coming home, home alone and watching MTV, just music videos all day long. And it was kind of a cool time because they were playing whatever, mm. you know, they would play rap, they would play heavy metal, they would play alternative music, they would play some really far out stuff and pop music, of course. But it was like they were just trying stuff because they were new. It was the 80s, mm. early 80s, early 90s, whatever. So um, I guess I was kind of exposed to a, a lot more than like you would be if you just listened to pop radio nowadays. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it was so segmented now, radio. Yeah, and I think then people were trying stuff out because it was kind of new, the the music television thing. So um, so that was kind of my first uh, experience of like falling in love with music. You know, I remember buying like Guns N' Roses cassettes uh-huh. and, and cassettes of bands I heard, you know, Lords of the Underground or Fugazi or whoever, you know, the far side, like cool bands and, and artists that I, that I found through that, you know, and I, I kind of gravitated towards some of the weirder ones, but, you know, I had all on cassette and as a kid, even before I had any instrument or, you know, knew how to play anything, I would just listen. I loved it. On your walk, man. On my walk, man, or on this like terrible little boom box that I had, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, I think we all had those, man. Uh, any brothers or sisters? I have a younger sister. She's quite a bit younger. So same parents, but she's uh, 11 years younger. Is she into music at all? She's into photography. She's into art. Um, she never picked up an instrument. Did, did you come from a musical family? Like, were your folks musical at all? Or? It's it, it's it's funny, man. Um, I can't I can't say that my folks were very musical or are very musical. Sometimes, you know, um, I hear like my dad or my mom kind of sing along to something, and and I'm I'm always struck that they actually have good voices but they're not you know musically trained in any way no instruments but my grandmother on my mother's side she she lives up here in the city uh she is super super musical and she played kind of a little bit of every instrument you know what i mean she would play mandolin and piano and accordion and guitar you know like kind of the old school like sing around the campfire kind of version of those instruments but you know she can you know she really has great taste in music. She loves it. She listens to classical music all day long. And uh, there was a point where she got into playing classical piano and she was pretty good, you know, you know, not a, at a professional level, but, you know, pretty cool. So she's kind of the the person in the family I most identify with musically. Yeah. Was that cool? As a, it must have been you loving music so much. It must have been cool as a kid hanging out with her, with her loving music Absolutely, so much. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, because she was just so stoked. You know, you tell your parents that you want to be a musician, and you know, as supportive as they are, they they're a little scared. You know, <laughs> she, she was all in. She thought it was just the best thing ever. You know what I mean? So yeah. that was cool. That's very cool, man. <laughs> Glad you got to have that. So, was playing guitar your original dream, or like since back then, or was there planning on doing something else? Or man, it kind it kind of always was. Like w- once I got what happened was um. You know, it, it speaks to the importance of music in the schools because I don't know if it would have happened unless one day a guitar player came into class. You know, it was we had like this like kind of dinky little keyboards class in my middle school. And uh, one day this guitar player came in, you know, he was like a local kid that had gone to Berkeley and he was looking to pick up some students. And the music teacher let him come in, and, you know, show off a little bit. And I heard him play and that was it. I was like, this is what I want to do. And I signed up for lessons. I got a cheap guitar. Um, this really ugly, uh, 
like flying V type Ibanez. <laughs> you still have it? Sp- spray painted. I think it's in my parents' closet somewhere. <laughs> spray painted purple and yellow. Nice. It was really like an impossible guitar for a kid to play. It was, you know, twice my size. Um, probably weighed 40 pounds, you know? That's great. Uh, <laughs> so, and I started taking lessons, you know, and that was it. I was totally hooked. And so you knew from then on, where'd you go to high, where'd you go to high school? Did you go to like a music high went, school? No, I didn't. I, w- I wish I did. I went to high school up in Westchester where my parents moved when, you know, before I went to high school. Mm. Um, and a kind of a cool artsy town called Katona. Um, mm. John Schofield lives there. It, you know, I went to, to high school with, with Sco's daughter. Um, so it was cool being around, you know, someone like that or having someone like that in the neighborhood, you know, <laughs> yeah. someone to look to, you know. Um, not that we got to play very much, but still just, you know, the presence, you know, it yeah. accounts for something. Yeah, totally, man. Um, you, you're still young in your career, but what have been some challenges that you've had to deal with so far that you've you've worked through and overcome either music, business, personal, anything? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um I guess, wow, how should I answer that? Um, you know, being a musician is challenging in so many ways. I'm really lucky to get to do it, and I'm constantly, you know, amazed at at what I get to do. You know, it, it is my dream. So many things that I dreamed about, you know, kind of came true. Uh, so I feel very, very lucky. Um, at the same time, there are things about it that are, are really challenging that I maybe didn't expect would be as challenging as they are, and um, maybe the, the – foremost of those is touring mm. and really realize how hard uh touring is uh because it, it, it's it's great in so many ways you get to go all these cool places uh you get to play for people you know make a living doing what you want to do but it's uh it's extremely unhealthy i i came to find out it's really rough on your body it's really rough on your health and uh your physical health and probably your mental health too and just being away from home for so long is is it's hard. You know, it's hard on you know if you have oh relationships, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, relationships, yeah. Luckily, I have a, a really awesome person in my life that seems to handle it very, very well. But um, yeah, man, that that is totally a, a challenge. You know, being on planes every day, um, it, it wears you out. And I'm I'm, I'm kind of still bouncing back from like what when i first started touring a lot you know my body kind of i went from being this like healthy athletic kid to to kind of being like oh man you know so i'm starting to catch up and figuring out how to how to do it in a more healthy way you know 10 years later okay now i, I kind of know what i need to do to get enough sleep to eat right to get enough exercise i'm figuring it out it took a long time so that's been a challenge for sure do you know, uh, I'm sure you know Oz Noy? Extremely well. That's uh, my man. Oz was saying, you know, people think it's tough because we got to, you know, lug equipment around and guitars. He goes, that's nothing. And he said that this is such a tough job. Exactly what you said, because it beats the crap out of your body you know, going on planes and zipping into and out of time zones. And then when you're there, you got a day off. You don't even know where the hell you are. And, you know, it, even if you're in the same country for two or three or four days, it's like you're traveling those two or three or four days is no yeah yeah you know what when you're on tour you're trying to you know it's for us it's how we make a living right so we don't want to take a day off to sightsee that would kind of defeat the the purpose of going out there to you know you want to get to the next gig kind of yeah and i i always do uh thus far have made a point to go out and see the places where i am you know if i have to take that day off i I, you know, I will, but it'll mostly be a half day and then I'll get on the plane at night or something like that. So, you know, we, there are really no days off. There might be like a a travel day where you have the morning off or something like that, you know, but you're really, you're on a plane every day or you're on a train or you're traveling, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not the worst, but, but it, it really adds up when you're doing it five, six months a year, um, and not being home. it's pretty terrible for your body. So finding, finding a way to, to deal with it and, you know, make sure you're getting that sleep, getting that exercise, eating well, and not like having your one meal at 1am and then, you know, getting to your hotel and sleeping for three hours and getting up and going to sound check and, you know, no, it's trying to make it a little more humane. <laughs> no, it's totally, I could envision that man. Eating healthy has got to be almost impossible. 
it's it's hard you know sometimes you just you know you have to eat what you're given at that time you know yeah. the, the venue or the promoter whoever takes you out and, you know but just making smarter choices and, and being more aware of you know what's what's going on um i think that you know i think that's that's having a positive effect you know on my end and i think that the culture has changed too you know musicians used to go on the road and um kind of destroy themselves when they weren't playing you know they would get through it by maybe you know drinking too much or doing whatever else and a lot of those artists kind of flamed out after a certain amount of time because they just couldn't keep doing it you know they'd be dead yeah so um i think there's been kind of a culture shift where you know some of the cats you go on, out on the road with are now they want to get to the gym in the morning they want to like go to a juice bar or something you Which know it's great it's great. Yeah. It's very different than it used to be. So, uh, you know, being around positive people like that has helped, you yeah. know, make sure that we're not, you know, drinking to get through it all. And, you know, instead we're like kind of trying to make the best of it and take care of ourselves. Man. And I can tell you as a guy, I'm probably your parents age. Uh, but I've been really making a concerted effort to eat healthy and take care of myself for like, you know, 25, 30 years. Right, it, right. Pay, it pays off. Yeah, it, man. It, you know, I look at some of my peers and I'm like, oh my God, not just visibly, but like, you know, I don't ever think about, oh, I can't do this, you know, physically. Right. You know, and, and I, th I think that, you know, as you get older, that becomes more and more important. It has to me. Anyway. Sure. Uh, well, sure. hey, yeah. Let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Um, I'm yeah. assuming you've moved on from that 40 pound Ibanez flying V. Um, what's your go to <laughs> guitar right now? And what other two or three guitars would round out your top list. Well, I didn't move that far from that guitar, which is funny. The, the, so, you know, that guitar was obviously on kind of on when my teacher saw that he was like, man, you got to get something else. <laughs> and eventually I, I went to, um, where did I get, I think it was a Sam Ash, uh, it was a Sam Ash store. And for 250 bucks, I got a Mexican Strat cool. uh, from it, it's a 94 Strat. And I bought it in 95. Is that the and Sam Ash on Central Avenue? In White Plains. Yeah, I know that store. Absolutely. Ha, ha, ha. Absolutely, man. <laughs> How funny is that? That very same one. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's where I got that guitar, and I've played that guitar ever since. That's my guitar. Um, I didn't do anything to it. I had to change the tuners once. I got refretted once. But I think that guitar has been played more than most guitars in the world. You know, I've really exclusively only played that guitar. It's just been played in to such a such an extent that i think it really i think it sounds good and it feels great you know that's and awesome. i'm so used to it and i love it i have other you know much more expensive guitars at this point but that's my one so you're playing that like almost all the time then exclusively almost almost all the time um some other guitars that i should mention um my but you know james valentine have you ever had him on the show yeah from maroon five sure did he exactly yeah, yeah. So I have one of his guitars. He he was super sweet. He gave Ernie me Ball? one of one of the Ernie balls, but it's one of the ones they used on the road. So it's still got like the you know the tour markings on it. I guess they were using it in a, a half step down. So it's you know it's marked from the tour, and, and it's a cool one. It's also been played in a little bit, and it sounds awesome. Super versatile. They're just great, man. They they feel great. So I, I really enjoy playing that one too. I also have a Sadowski that uh roger um was nice enough to give me that's really awesome he's in new york he's a new york builder right he's in new york yeah and we might work on something together soon maybe more of a strat type thing cool man. um so yeah i really love that one too i've got a bunch of old guitars too now not nothing too crazy but this old fender electric 12 that i really love some really cool stuff that's so funny how do you know james spoiled. man i've known james for maybe five or six years we've been really good friends um i think we first met through yannick wisdala yannick and james play a lot of tennis together okay and yeah, uh out in tennis. la and i played on some of uh yannick's records i think that's how we first met uh but we've been buddies for a long time he's such a great dude such an awesome player yeah he was a very nice guy to chat with man super inten oh, man. intense guy which i like you know and he's he's like very extremely balanced you know oh, it goes out of his way to be like that he's just he's just the best dude he's just you know a great example of like someone that you can look up to anybody can can look up to a guy like that and i think all the fans and and all the 
the people that love him, you know, love him for the right reasons. He's not one of those, you know, no. artists. He's a superstar. And then, you know, in secret is some sort of monster. He's the total <laughs> opposite. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. a role model. You know, it's yeah. pretty awesome. That's cool, man. Um, are there any players who influence you that people might be surprised to hear? Uh, well, probably my biggest influence is Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, and I don't know how much comes forward in, in the playing, but that's why I play that guitar. It's a, it's just a, the, a strat with 13s on it, heavy strings. Holy and, uh, shit. You play with 13s. I do. Yeah, I do. And you know, I'm used to it by now. It doesn't seem like a big wow. deal, but, um, that was because when I was a kid, Stevie Ray Vaughan was, he was the first, I mean, I, you know, I loved Clapton. I loved Hendrix. I loved Jimmy Page and I still love all those guys, but Stevie Ray Vaughan was the first guy that like melted my brain in, in a whole new way. You know, I wanted to, you know, learn every solo and hear every record and, you know, something about the visceralness and the way he was kind of cha channeling it, you know, really stuck with me. Um, I still love listening to him. That's really impressive that you play with 13s, man. I'm, I'm still stuck on that. Are you a big guy? I not, as, you know, not especially. I'm not, I'm not huge. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm about six foot. Wow. You're manhandling those things, man. That's, you gotta be a, a trooper to play with 13s, man. Good for you. Desert Island. What do you remember the first CD you got ever? Well, it was a cassette. Uh, it was uh, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion 1. I, this this will tell you how young I was, how green I was. I bought Use Your Illusion 1 on cassette. I don't know how old I was, 8, 9? Mm -hmm. And then I got Use Your Illusion 2 after that. And I thought that you had to listen to Use Your Illusion 1 in its entirety before it was like reading a book or watching a movie. Like you can't start in the middle. Yeah. You got to start at the beginning every time. So I would listen to use your illusion one and then I would put on use your illusion two and I get like two tunes in and that would be it. So I don't think I ever heard the whole, <laughs> you know, as a kid, I didn't know any better. That's actually kind of cute to be honest with oh you. My God. Very youthful innocence. You know, no that, one told me any different when that, when those albums came out, you probably don't know this, but how they released those was, they had no one had ever done this before. They had the record stores open at midnight, open until midnight. You know, so like like my local record store at the time I was living in South Florida was like I don't know coconuts or something like that in the local uh -huh. retail mall. I and they coconuts. yeah, they closed down at you know normal eight nine o'clock, and then they reopened like you know at twelve. But you had to form a line outside. And I remember going down there and getting the, you know, use your illusion one, use your illusion two. It was pretty wow. wild. Yeah, it was it was pretty smart marketing. Those were the days, man, when people would, would wait in line for hours to buy a new record. Yes, it was cool. Now was they're cool. waiting for chicken. There's some chicken place open near the gym yesterday. And I'm like, what the hell is this line? Apparently, they were giving out a free chicken meal for a month. And it was like, and someone's like, oh, somebody slept over. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, what? Wow. I, I hope I never have so little to do in my life. <laughs> that, that, that's that's what I'm investing my time in. Please shoot me. I, I think that's fine. But just the fact that, you know, the, they'll do that. But then, like, you know, if, if this great new artist releases a new record, people could really care less. Right. So, or read a book. The, no, know, I'm the, not going to do that. They'll, they'll get to it. Yeah, they'll get to it when they get to it. You know, it's not it's not urgent. It's not important. It's not an event. No. It's just like, oh, yeah, the new record come out. Uh, I'll download it next week. You know, right. I got shit to, to look at on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's kind of sad because that was such a cool thing. I caught the tail end of that, of like, you know, a record coming out and like you looked forward to it for a month and then it came out and you waited for it and you went to the record store and you got it. And then you went straight home and listened to the whole entire thing, undivided attention. Yeah. That was pretty cool. That was cool. It, and it, it, it attached a tremendous, you know, there's a lot of emotional vesting when you do that. And yeah, man, you don't have that anymore. And I think that's part of the reason why the attachment to music is is not as great as it used to be for the masses. It, ha it had a ton of significance, you know, when you did that. The mu it really meant a lot. And that's how I think, you know, fans got so attached to these bands and these artists, you know, because it was a significant moment when they did that. You know what I mean? Yes. It meant a lot to them. Yeah, for sure, man. Now it's like here today, God, tomorrow. They liked you yesterday. Now, you know, you know, and what I do, I'm lucky because I, I play jazz guitar. The fans are a little bit more, um, it, it's different than pop music in that, you know, 
people are really attracted to um, who they think are the best players and it doesn't really change day to day. Whereas like someone can like a band one day and now they, they hate a next record. They're on to the next band. They couldn't care less about the old band. You know, it, it's do. very transient um, in pop music for better or worse. You know, there, you know, it has its, its benefits there too, but you know, interesting. I also interviewed a session guy, Oh, back a while ago, Jerry McPherson in Nashville. Do you know Jerry? He's in Nashville. I don't know. He's been in Nashville 30 years. He's an A-list first call guy. Brilliant guy. He's played on, you know, literally thousands of hit records. And he said they have it to the point now where you've got to get to the punchline really quick. Like people aren't sitting around waiting to hear a verse, then a chorus. You got to get to that chorus somehow like really, really quick because they're just not going to stick around, which is like mind boggling. Yeah. The hook's got to be like really up front. I think it'll cycle back eventually, you know, these trends in music, you know, they don't last forever. Yes. So we might, we might be entering that like hyper hooky phase, you know, where it's just like ear candy all around, but it's not going to last forever. You know, people that there'll be a reaction to that people will want to hear something of real, you know, um, depth and character and integrity again, not that that stuff, I mean, that stuff is all crafted brilliantly. Uh, there's an art to it. And like the best musicians will always find a way to make whatever, you know, whatever they have to do, they're going to make art out of it. You know, they're going to work around it, you know? So if you have to have a hook and then another hook and then the third hook, and that's all the song is allowed to be, they're going to find a way to make that genius and amazing and brilliant. Sure. Um, but I think there'll be a, you know, and it hasn't gone away either. You know, there's real songwriting out there. People are still doing it. Yes. They never stop. Um, just in terms of the, of the, um, general public's acceptance of that stuff, it'll swing back. I, I think certain. so. I think so. I yeah. agree with you. I, I certainly hope it does. That's why I don't, I think part of that has contributed also to, um, you know, with Spotify and streaming, like my kids are always like, dad, why, you know, why don't you get Apple music or whatever, or Spotify? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to listen to one song. I want to listen to the album because, you know, the artists I, or the musicians I'm listening to, I think they have something to say. And I want to like hear that. I can't hear that in a song. You know, I want to hear what I want to hear what they're about. I, I want to, you know, it's like going on a first date, you know, give them a shot, you know? <laughs> you know, anyway, talk about Desert Island Discs since we're talking about music in no particular order and knowing that this could change tomorrow. What's like your knee jerk reaction to the top three Desert Island Discs you'd choose right now? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I'll jump to um, a record that I listened to a lot as a kid. I think even like one of my trying to remember who gave it to me it, i think it was one of my teachers in uh middle school or something or high school was he knew i played guitar and he was like hey check this out and it was a steve earl record called train a coming are you hip to that record i'm not hip to that record i'm hip to steve earl I so it's, not- it's a record that, that steve earl made in nashville with a lot of you know great like you know nashville session cat string players and uh, I don't know. I was really taken by that record. I, and I still really love it. You know, this it, it comes on, and I don't know. I feel like kid again. I, I I love that record. The songwriting's so great. He's telling a story. The musicians are all kind of like working to tell the story of those songs. I mean, really a story. These are like these songs are are these journeys. Um, so that record really kind of stuck with me. I don't know if it in it you know made its way into my my jazz playing, but maybe the the concept of like really uh making the song come to life and tell a story the way those musicians did on that album i don't know i love that record that one sticks with me for sure and it's called train a coming train a coming yeah check That's it cool. out it's, i am gonna check it out a pretty brilliant record i don't know if it would have the same effect on me if i hadn't have heard it so much as a kid yeah but that was just a, a record that was totally on on loop um, but that's what's so good about music. It, it, there's certain parts of your life where it's the fabric of the soundtrack of your life. And that's why, totally. you know, it's not because necessarily, oh, this is the greatest music ever performed. It's just like it fits you and it does something to you. And that's all that counts, man. Yeah, that that one for sure. 
I don't know, Desert Island Discs. Um, probably a Beatles, Beatles record. Maybe Sgt. Pepper is another one I listened to a time as a kid. Probably Stevie Ray Vaughan, Texas Flood. Um, that was an important one for me. Jazz records. Um, I'm, I'm over three. Can I keep going? You can. Special today only. Uh, <laughs> well, there's this. It's not. It's not even really a record, but this. Um, this Charlie Christian solo on this tune called "Swing to Bop," which is recorded at a, j- a jam session at uh, Minton's in Harlem. Um, whenever it was recorded, at, uh, early on in, in in the early days of, of you know bebop in New York City. Um, that's a really, 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 really incredible guitar solo. And, and you can still listen to it today and it sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. It's so modern and he's so rhythmic and his phrasing is really amazing. So that's one that's, that has stuck with me as a jazz record. Was that like recorded at the Apollo probably? At Minton's. This oh, at little Minton's. Club okay. Thank after you. hours jam session. I'm going to check and, that uh, out too. Yeah, yeah. The playing on that is really like... It's super futuristic. It's way different than his stuff with Benny Goodman. It just sounds super modern. It's crazy. It sounds like it could be recorded in 2010 and still be like forward looking. You know what I mean? It's really <laughs> so, wild. I'm going to look that one up. I was hoping you were going to say like use your illusion too, just because <laughs> now, now you can say it. <laughs> I don't know if I ever finished listening to it. <laughs> Oh man. Love Slash though, man. Slash really woo. Yeah. Guy Rocks. A bad dude. I actually interviewed his guitar player, Frank Sidoris. Do you know Frank? No, I don't. Good guy. Yeah. What do you like most about yourself? That's a tough question, I know. Oh my goodness. Um Well, I guess musically, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift it keep it in the music arena. Oh, you're being politically but- correct. No, I, I one. I think one of my worst qualities in real life <laughs> has has been kind of good in in music. In that I'm I'm pretty stubborn. I'm a stubborn guy, and and when not intentionally, but you know, when I was a kid and I wanted to play the strat that I played, and uh, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan was my hero, but I wanted to kind of be a jazz guitarist in a way. You know, that kind of came more into focus as I got older and went to Berkeley and really started playing with guys that that were you know real jazz guys for the first time had no real connection to the rock and blue stuff that i grew up with they were just you know through and through jazz guys um a lot of my teachers up to that point and even a lot of those guys they're like you can't play that strat you can't play that way if you want to do this a a lot of just think i think today it would be different because it's become more accepted but around the time that I started doing it. It was like a a huge no, no. So many things like, Hey man, you sound great, but you got to get rid of that guitar. You know, you need a a hollow body or a semi hollow body. Hollow body. Yeah. I mean, semi hollow body was pushing it. It's like, you need a jazz box. So I think I was stubborn enough to be like, I know that that criticism is coming from a good place. And I've always been open to, you know, if someone tells me like, Hey, you know, your time could, could be better, you know, and it, there's some part of me that knows that that is probably true. So that's advice that I would be like, okay, you're right. Let me, let me get to work. But there were certain things like stylistic things where I, as, as a young man, I I was like, you know what? I know this criticism is coming from a good place, but it's just not right for me. And I tell all my students that, you know, I teach at the new school here in, in New York city. And, you know, I tell them all like, you know, I'm going to give you the best advice I can and, and tell you all the things that I think will be good for you. But if you know in your heart that a piece of advice for me or any of your other teachers isn't right for you, just don't take it. You know, you have to follow your heart in music. Um, that's the only way it's going to lead you to the place you want to go, right? That's what we're doing. We're kind of out on a limb here trying to follow our dreams and follow our heart. And if we stop listening to our heart, we're not going to end up in, in, in the place we want. It's you not know? music even. It's, you know, yeah, it's kind of becoming more of a job, I guess, you know, which it is, it is that too. So, you know, but all, you know, all my, my wackiest students, you know, the guys that are like, you know, really out in outer space on a limb, I always want to support them as much as possible because they're really following their, you know, it might not be the most practical thing in the world, but, but it it might lead to the most amazing place. And you you never want to shut off that, that you never want to cut that road off. 
Yeah, that's because it's a everything we do is freaking journey. You know, it's not like it's not like where you are today. At least you hope to God it's not like where you are today is you're finishing. You know, the finishing line is really far away, man. You never know, man. And 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 you know, like these, you know, we're chasing these dreams. You know, and everybody is. Everybody know, is music, not, not music. Me- yeah, right. Exactly. So, I think being stubborn a little bit can be a good thing because there are a lot of people that, you know, try to shut it down for whatever reasons, even good intentioned reasons. Sure. You know, they say, you know, I want the best for you. Don't, don't follow your dream here. Be a little more practical. Get that jazz box if you want to play jazz. And as a kid, I was like, thanks, but no thanks. Good for you. So I think that that's, that's been a good, uh, you know, and and that's just one example of many, but, um, you know, you gotta be a little stubborn in this business, I guess. No, I think I persevere. I think that is a, as a guy coming out of the business sector, I think that's a very common trait for any entrepreneur that is ultimately successful. And you are an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur in the music business. And, right. you know, following the crowd, there's this guy, uh, uh, I, w- I listened to a lot of self development tapes, especially when I was younger, uh, called Earl Nightingale. And he made this record record called lead the field. And he said, he goes, one of the smartest things you could do. And he had this awesome speaking voice. Like it's like giving you a, a a sonic hug rapping. He was like, really? I was like, just listen to the guy. I was like, Oh man. (laughs) Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll, Yes. I'll do whatever you say. So, but, um, and he said something like, you know, in this thing, lead the field, uh, look at what everybody else is doing and do the opposite. That's the, like the, the number one thing you need to do if you want to be successful, because f- most following the crowds, you know, the masses are not, you know, the ladder of success gets small. The, the people that, that climb it, there's fewer and fewer people. There, are not more and more people. So I thought that made a lot of sense, you know, and especially, you know, something like that. That's a, you're not doing anything illegal, unethical, immoral. You just want to play a guitar that you like. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> right. Great, you know, shame on you. Right. I don't buy into yeah. that kind of shit. It's ridiculous, man. Well, good for you. you know, I'm glad think, you did that. I think part of it is that, like, you're not, um, you're not, you're not being contrary just to be contrary, right? You're just really doing something that you believe in, or, or you're following through an idea that you had that was quirky or weird or not, not standard in some way. You know, it's not like, hey, everyone's doing this, so I'm going to do this just to do the opposite. I, I don't know if that's going to lead anywhere cool. Yes. But if you really believe it, hey, man, like, give it a shot. You know, give it your best shot. And and I think that's kind of the only way to get to a special place is kind of by, you know, following your heart in, into some uncharted territory. Good for you, man. What did you get? You, like, have a lot of uh, common sense for a guy your age. I don't mean this, that. I don't mean that condescending. That sounded, like, awful. But I meant, like, in a really supportive, positive way. Like, I certainly – you're, like, running rings around me when I – you're probably running rings around me now. But uh, I certainly didn't have that uh, confidence and wisdom at your age. It's funny because, you know, common sense-wise, I'll, I will do the dumbest, dumbest, <laughs> most nonsensical things – you know, I, I, <laughs> my girlfriend laughs at me. She sees me doing something, something simple, like the way I I load the dishwasher, and she's like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, but that's not. This <laughs> is a philosophy of life. That's a you know, Maybe, yeah. the dishes sure, is sure. not going to impact your life. I assure you, I've loaded hey, tons of fucking dishes. <laughs> certain things, certain things, you know, I'll approach with a certain amount of grace and wisdom, and other things. I will approach so backwards. I don't know why, but <laughs> good for you, man. Well, you're doing what the right you, thing. What, what are you thinking? What is, you know, I'm like, you're right. What am I doing? <laughs> I hear you, man. Hey, um, tell me something about yourself. And you might've just said it that people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd besides you load the dishwasher. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, another, another music one that that's a, a little unexpected is um, when uh, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have many teachers uh, at first because it, it was kind of like slim pickings in the suburbs where I lived. I could have gotten to the city, but that seemed like as a kid, it just seemed like an impossible thing to do to go into the city for lessons. You know, we were an hour away. That's a lot of work. And there was yeah. really 
it just it just didn't i mean as a kid i don't know now it would be like of course go do that but but as a kid didn't seem possible and there weren't really many people around but there was a little stretch where i had this great teacher this guy named frank debretti who's still out there doing stuff um and he was only my teacher for a short amount of time because he moved to nashville um he didn't stick around in the suburbs of the city for too long but he really wanted to be a, a country session guy and he did he, he moved to nashville and did just that and i think he's in houston now and he was a great player and a really great teacher for, as a kid you know he's my first real teacher um but through him i kind of got this bug to be a, i wanted to be a country session guy just like him you know what i mean and then after him i didn't have a teacher for a very long time and the next guy i ended up with was arlen roth well, do you know arlen roth I, I, yeah of course i had arlen on the show last week i just interviewed he's a him. country gets He's a country guitar legend. Yeah. And he was an amazing teacher too. Yeah. So I really thought I might end up being a country session guy. Uh, you know, I was probably 16, 17 years old and I loved it. And I was checking out all those guys and learning from Arlen, you know, one of the greats. He was living in Westchester and, uh, at the time. Is that right? He was. Yeah, yes. Right, right. He was. <laughs> he was. <laughs> Dude, this is <laughs> such my, a small my... world. It's like nuts. It's so nutty. He was. He was. And he was the loveliest, most yeah. awesome dude he took mm. such great care of me you know because he had he had hot Lakes video mm. oh this is another hilarious thing i worked for hot Lakes video in high school did you I would really go after, I would, fulfillment if you bought a, if if exactly if you bought a hot Lakes video i might have packaged it in the little like post office thing gone to the post office and sent it to your house that's awesome that's what i was doing after school thanks to arlen yeah and he let me take home some videos and i think i even transcribed some of this, like the Jimmy Thackeray video, I remember I transcribed probably half of that. That's so and, cool. Uh, put it into music for the, you know, the little booklet. Um, so that's thanks to Arlen. He was like, he was very, 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 very generous with me. Um, he was a super cool guy. And he was one of my, you know, one of the few teachers that I've really had that have been like real mentors. Um, yeah, he's a very, but, very caring, very genuine yeah, he's guy, the, man. A beautiful, beautiful cat. Yeah, he is. Uh, so, so you know, to answer the question, a uh, thing that people might not expect, I, at some point I thought I was going to be a country session guy. Um, do you hear my dog howling? Yeah, man. Is she in pain? What the hell is going on up there no, in, no, in, no, your, that, in your that, apartment there near your father? <laughs> she, she, she is a wild animal. That's her. She doesn't bark. She just howls. <laughs> hey, her it's good she to see somebody having a dog, you know, in this city. Oh, man. When I was a kid, it was real funny. Um, when I was a kid, I I was working when I was real young. I was like 14. And then I was, I was a, a summer worker. I was like a messenger. This is before, you know, you'd pick up a package at location A and bring it to location B. This is before fax machines, uh, you know, all that kind of and internet, of course, email. Totally. And so, and then I was always in the city because I used to like to hang out there. The only dogs you would see in the city is like when you're walking down fifth Avenue, and you, you would see extremely wealthy women with these really like eccentric like you know like a freaking poodle that's four and a half feet tall or like uh <laughs> what are those dogs with the af a, an afghan you know what that is it's like yeah, a man. massive dog with and they were like really expensive dogs or you'd see like the bellman and he'd be sitting there he'd have like eight dogs you know walk them out of the apartment building, you know, let them take a shit three feet away in the little square that the tree was in. It was just such a weird, you know, you wouldn't see like normal people having dogs for some reason. I don't know. It was very, <laughs> so it's so it funny because we were in the city two weeks ago and I was walking around. And again, this is just a shit that sticks with you from your kid, just like that music, just like the, uh, you know, the Steve Earl record stuck with you. I was, we were down in the village with my wife, my wife and I were there and I, uh, it was normal people walking dogs. And I said, Hey babe, you know, it's really good to see people. And I'm sure that like normal people always had dogs, but that's all I saw. Cause I was, it was just weird. I can't explain it. But anyway, <laughs> this is not about me. It's about you. I've made a fool enough of myself here. Uh, and one, one, one of the greatest sights <laughs> I ever saw in New York city, I was walking down the street and this woman on her cell phone had the biggest dog I've ever <laughs> seen. This, this thing was the most enormous i didn't know dogs could be this big it was like the, it was like the size of of a person like a large person it was the biggest dog i've ever seen and she was on her phone and the dog had drool coming down its face this huge like this 
this slobber that reached from its mouth to the ground and just stayed there. And this woman was on her phone, not paying attention to anything. And another woman was walking her little dog (laughs) past the big dog. And the little dog saw the big dog and was totally transfixed. The little dog said, this is my, my God. Now (laughs) she laid down, she laid down in front of the big dog and would not move. And the lady kept trying to pick her up and, and the dog would jump out of her arms and lay down and worship the big dog. And the lady on her cell phone just could not be bothered. She was just not paying attention while the slobber just dripped onto this little dog. It was a really, real New York City moment. I don't know if that story translates as well. You kind of had to have been there. No, no, it totally translates. That's hilarious. It translates to, um, you know, I think it would translate to two two people. One, people who are familiar with the city, but two, people who are familiar with how – the lack of awareness that most people have as they go through the daily motions of life. I'm like amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I knew this lady would not get off her phone or touch her dog or, you know, get involved in any way, but I can't believe a dog could be that big and that you would have it in a New York city apartment. Wow. Yeah. That's a, well, man, you'll notice as you get older, like what we see is, um, you know, my kids are 28, 26 and 18. So for most of their lives, like cell phones were not around, but you see the same thing. Like we go out to dinner and they're on the phone, but it's their kids that are completely getting ignored. You know, like they're at a dinner table and it's like a whole family and like the kids are like trying to talk to the parents and they're like, Shh, and I'm on my cell phone, you know, looking at oh, Facebook man. or whatever. It's just like, holy crap. And I'm, and I, I might have been that way. I don't know. I hope I wouldn't have, but I'm really glad I didn't have that option. You know, that I was forced. Yeah, to- that's another thing that I think will turn around. People will get bored with that sooner or later, you know. From your lips to it'll God's ears, course. man. I certainly hope it'll so, run man. Its course. Yeah, it'll run its course. Hey, who's had the biggest influence in your life? Uh, of all people or musicians? Pick whatever you want, man. It's a magic show. All, anything uh, your way. Man, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, friends and family and, and, and whatever, music teachers, you know, I, like I said, I've been with my girlfriend for, for 10 years. She's, she's been a huge That's influence awesome. me uh, on obviously, you know, uh, make me, you know, keep my shit together. Um, <laughs> so that's been that's been big um, as in terms of uh, guitar teachers. Some of those guys I mentioned um Arlen Roth and, and um, Frank DeBretti, uh, these guys I had as teachers early on. At Berkeley, uh, are you hip to Dave Tronzo, phenomenal no. guitar player? No. He would be a great guy to, to have on because he can just go. You know, you get him talking and it, it's the twilight zone within 20 minutes. He can talk <laughs> about anything <laughs> and, and the conversation will he – know, he just knows so much about That's so awesome. many things. You know what I mean? Dude, I'm going to so write that down. About, Hold on. It's, it's yeah, the David Twilight Trans- Zone. No, I'm going to write down. No, what you said. It's the Twilight oh. Zone in 20 minutes. That was hilarious. Man, he'll be giving you like a, a, a lecture on igneous rocks within, you know, five <laughs> minutes. He'll just, that'll be where it went or whatever else. Oh, uh, but God. he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guitar player, um, slide guitar player, um, and a real genius. Um but I remember he said something to me that was really cool. He said, uh, he's like, when you're playing with some guys and something about it is too advanced for you, maybe the rhythm is, is beyond what you're capable of or the, you don't understand the harmony or you're lost in the form or if something's just beyond your grasp. He said, in those cases, just go for it anyway. Just go for it. And that was really, really great advice. That was like something that no one had really been able to put into words before that really resonated with me. Because I would I would always be like in those situations, I would kind of go back into myself and I'd be too scared or too nervous to really I would I would give it a try and say, Oh no, I'm I, I can't do this. But it was kind of like that thing where like you have to just throw yourself into it and and that's how you learn to do it. You know, like learning how to surf or riding a bike or whatever. Yeah. You just have to do it. So he was the first guy to say, I still remember that quote all these years later. So that goes to show that, you know, you know what? I am so glad you said that because I've never played with people. And I'm getting ready to go play with a few guys and I'm like, I'm not scared, but I know that's going to happen. And now I know how to react to that. Just like, there's no downside. Just throw, do it, you know, just do it. Right. Just throw yourself into it, you know, and that's the only way. And, you know, 
it actually feels really good to just release yourself from that, that fear yes. in the moment. You it's, know what I mean? Yes. Instead of st- standing there on stage, like frightened and, and doubting yourself, just go for it. And uh, that was helpful. I have to remind myself of that all the time, but you know, what That's a great, great quote. Thank you. What's your favorite New York city food, man? Woo. Uh, Name a name a style of food. I'll, I'll tell you uh, the best place to get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a foodie. You eat a lot. You, like, uh, yeah, we go out to eat a lot. That's cool. Very cool. Hey, you want to hear a funny? This is a. Do you know Rosa Mexicano? The one down on like yeah. 18th Street, though, near on like East 18th Street, just right off of um, Broadway over there. I've been to one of the Rosa Mexicanos, but not. I don't think I've been to that one. So we were staying down like near Union Square, and I loved the margarita. We, my wife and I both liked the margaritas there, so we went over there and we had a few drinks. And I'm walking out, and I always eat healthy, right? Even after I drink margaritas and eat chips. <laughs> so there's like this looked like a really cool salad place, like on the left on the on the south side of the street. We're walking west back towards uh, Fifth Avenue over there, and so I go in there, and I was pretty buzzed to be honest with you from the drinks. And uh, it was really weird. It was like robots working there. I, I mean, like everybody was moving in such a robotic. It was like a dystopian future. I mean, nobody had any soul in there. And I'm thinking, man, that's because I'm. Uh, it's got to be because I'm. I'm. I'm kind of buzzed. And so, um, I, I buy my shit, and it was greatest salad I ever had in my life. And um. You know, brought it back to the room, and my I go up to the front because my wife doesn't eat like me, and I go and she she goes, God, what's up with those people? They're like robots. <laughs> and I'm wow. like, well, I'm glad you said that because I thought it was just me because I was all buzzed and shit. It was really weird. Um, wow, it was it, bizarre. Sorry, man. I I don't I had to just get that out of my system. I've never seen that before. Man, what I love about New York City going out to eat is not you know the food is fantastic, but. What I love is that some of these places have been around for so long and like, you know, you can only imagine what's happened between those four walls. You know, yeah. all the people that have e- eaten there literally like just crazy characters or, you know, people that were politicians or musicians or actors or whatever. So some of these places have so much character. So there's that, too. There's like the co- like total corporate soulless robot salad chain or whatever but then there's also this place that's been around since 1945 and, yes you know so i that's something that i, I love about the city the, the places that have real soul and character so tell me favorite pizza place man uh probably defara pizza in brooklyn totona's is also really excellent um those would be those would be probably my, my two favorite and they're both really old like super classic like the defara guy looks like he could have invented pizza you know he's got <laughs> He's like 90,000 years old <laughs> and he still does everything himself. How about, how about Mexican? What do you like? Oh, Mexican's a hard one. Um, I'd like a lot of the new modern, uh, Mexican restaurants. There's one called Cosme that that's, uh, super, it's a little more high end, but it's, Where it's killer. That? It's, it's in, uh, actually close to what, what you were talking about, close to 18th street. I think it's in the twenties. Uh, it's this guy that has a couple restaurants in Mexico city. Um, I think his name is Enrique Alvera. I might be wrong. Um, and there's a there's also a new, a new one in Brooklyn that's really good called Alta Calidad. And do you, go to, uh, do you go to Brooklyn a lot? Well, I live in Brooklyn. Oh, I thought you lived in this. I thought you were up west side near Oz for some reason. Okay. No, uh, my my grandparents are. Okay. My grandparents live very close to Oz, and he's been over to my grandparents' place to hang out, which that's is awesome. so funny. Him and your um, mom, and yeah. your grandma jamming. <laughs> I don't think they broke out the guitars, but there was definitely a hang going on. That's yeah, cool. I love, Oz is a really good friend. He's yeah, he's that's the cool, man. man. Um, I just spoke to him yesterday. I think the day before we're actually going to teach um, this camp together. Um, two weeks, week and a half. Upstate New York, Joel Harrison has a camp. So Oz, myself, David Gilmore, the jazz kid, David Gilmore. Yeah, I know and, uh, I, I, He played on. Uh, he did a lot of work on Reggie. You know Reggie Washington? Yeah, sure. Yeah, he did. So that guy I told you, Tony Lewis, went to music and art with Reggie. So I was hearing Reggie and his brother's name, like when Tony, Tony and I were like literally kids together when he first started going to music and art. So I interviewed Reggie. That's a did great. You go to music interview. and art? No, 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 no. Man, no, I was no. I was a nerd. I got into I got in, but my folks didn't let me go. Um, I don't oh. know why. Um, uh, 
but so David Gilmore played on Reggie's album, which the uh, tribute to Jeff Lee Johnson. Oh, right on. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. did some good Jeff work Lee on Johnson that. Jeff Lee Johnson was one of my favorites. I loved it. Oh, loved yeah. playing. Very good. So where is, where is, is this camp up in Indian something oh, upstate? Yeah. Big Indian. Yeah. And Mark Indian. Leteri's on it. Too. Yeah. Okay. Mark yeah. Leteri's. Man, what a, that's a great group. It's dude. a fun crew of guys. Yeah. I interviewed Mark. It'll great guy. Great guy. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, Mark's awesome. Yeah, I can see you guys getting along. Actually, he's he's a, yeah, very smart, very smart guy as well. Um, we play in a band together. Mark and I do this Bob Reynolds guitar band thing. That's I think it, it, there's a record out, but there's also a lot of YouTube stuff out. Two guitar band with us. Um, pretty fun. That's so funny. I, like I said, this is such a small world. Oh, the, totally. The man. guitar universe is so, so. I know a bunch of guys he's doing it. A seminar up there. Uh, who is it? Oh, like Robin Ford and and Jeff. Do you know Jeff Macerlane? I do know Jeff. Jeff's awesome, man. Yeah, he's a real cool guy. He's Jeff's in Brooklyn. A New York City no, guy. yeah, he's in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. he's in he Brooklyn. I, I'm pretty sure Brooklyn. Yeah, he is. Yeah, and so he's he, a sweetheart, man. I he was one of the like you know I had those couple teachers I talked about, but that was just for small periods. You know, there were years where I, I couldn't find a, a teacher when I was a kid and I would just get guitar player magazine. That was kind of the only, it was before YouTube lessons. It was before finding anything online really. And I would get these guitar player magazines. And I remember one of Jeff's columns and all these guys that I know in New York city now, Adam Levy, Adam, yeah. I, I finally, yeah, I finally met them, you know, 15 years later. And I was like, man, I read your column. <laughs> it's just hilarious. That is cool, man. Very cool. Um, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music besides food? Oh, everything, man. Yeah, I, I love um, I love reading. I love movies. I love running, um, traveling. You know, e the tour part uh, is maybe not my favorite, but being in the actual place, you know, once I get there, you know, I've gotten to see a lot of the world and it's been awesome. Um, so there are things about that that I really, really, really love. What's sure. the be best advice you've ever been given? And you might have answered it already with uh, that Dave Tronzo guy, but uh, what's the best advice you've ever been given in general? Best advice I've ever been given. Man, these, you saved all the hard ones for last. <laughs> uh, I've ever been given. If I started with the hard ones, we'd go nowhere, man. <laughs> right. um, this sounds ridiculous, but I, I think just – that whole like follow your heart thing that we were talking about. No one gave me that advice, but it's just something that I, I just decided for myself. I think that's been the clearest like example of like a, a principle to live by that I've found. And I don't consistently apply it. I fail all the time, but I have to remind myself of that, of like, you know, good things happen when you do that. I don't know what it is, but it's like, you know, we fight ourselves so much of the time to kind of get to these places we think we're supposed to be. And it doesn't seem to, to work out right. You know what I mean? It's like we're fighting, fighting the universe, you know, whereas yeah. you can kind of just not. It, it's not to say that you don't have to work hard for it. No, you know, totally you have not. to work twice as hard, you know, but at least you're fighting for the right thing. Yeah, I agree. I think when things happen organically, instead of. I mean, it's important to push for things, but, you know, really most things that are meant to be happen without, you know, pushing and getting a reward as opposed to pushing, 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 and it's just not working, but you're not going to give up. You know, sometimes you get to a point where, you know, you got to just there's wonder, is it the some, right decision? Yeah, there's got to be some, I mean, like different examples, like say I, I have to learn music for an upcoming concert, like. I'm going to have to work my butt off to do it, but I love the work as well. Whereas like booking flights, I don't love that, but <laughs> it's, it's part of, it's part of, you know, working towards something that I do love, which is performing. Sure. So I feel like as long as, as the push is, there's some, you know, some reward in and of itself, like I getting to play your guitar all day, learning music, you know, you might be busting your butt, but you know, there's still some, some joy in the process, right? Yeah. There should be. So, um, I don't know. I think just, you know, pushing for the right thing, you'll know that it's right. If part of the push is something you, you know, that you love the journey and not just what you imagine will be the reward. Yeah, totally, man. I think that's good sage advice. And the last question, man, is 
What's your definition of happiness, Nier? Um, happy definition of happiness. Um, Besides a slice of pizza at Defar's. <laughs> I think that you know being truly happy is it, it's it's kind of connected to what we do when we play jazz because when we play jazz we're trying to be totally in the moment we're not like looking ahead or looking behind we're just kind of trying to be right there and be present you know and open and I feel like you know those moments you are most truly happy in like if you're in Hawaii and you see that sunset and it's magical and you know, a big smile just comes on your face and you just can't control it. And you, you're kind of watching yourself from the outside, smiling at this beautiful thing that you're seeing. You're truly in the moment. You're not thinking about what you're going to do after sunset. You're not thinking about the flight in. You know what I mean? You're just there and you're truly content in the moment. So I feel like trying to, to stay present, to stay in the moment. Well, kind of, it, it's funny because, you know, we were just out in paradise in Hawaii and, uh, even still, we we kind of met a bunch of people that didn't seem super stoked. We, we met some people that kind of seemed a little bit miserable out there in paradise. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because it, it didn't seem like it was all that uncommon. But imagine what they're like I, normally when they're in St. Louis or whatever. You know, <laughs> that's scary. Well, it wasn't. It, it wasn't just people on vacation that were stressed out about vacation. It was, you know, some people that lived there, you know, year round. But, um, I feel like when you stay in the moment, when you're not too focused on the past or the, or the future, but you're right there in the moment, you can truly realize all the things that you have, all the things that you have to be grateful for. You know what I mean? Just, it's kind of right there in front of you. Wow. Like you can take in how amazing it is that you're, alive and and you know everyone's got their struggles but everyone also has their you know the things that have been bestowed upon them so when you're in the moment you can kind of appreciate all that you know i'm looking around the room right now i'm, I'm blown away you know what i mean it doesn't take that much all, mm. all these little things they, they really mean a lot so true happiness i don't know i i think you might already have it but not realize it you know you might be too focused on on the, the past and the future to really be there in the now and, and know what it is that you have. Man, I thought that was uh, very eloquently and succinctly said, man. So uh, thank you very much. Hey, uh, I'm going to tell people where to find you, but I just want to let you know, I really appreciate this time we spent together. It's been real nice getting to know you. Oh, and man. I wish you nothing but a, a ton blast, of success, man. man. You're going to do great. Oh, thanks and, so uh, much, man. Anything I can thanks, do to help Greg. you out, I will be happy to support oh, you. Man. Let me this tell super fun. Same here, man, and I'm happy you came on the show. Everybody, uh, check out Nier Felder. It's Nier, N-I-R, Felder, F-E-L-D-E-R. Uh, he's got an upcoming album coming out. That's redundant. He's got an album coming out soon. And go log on his page, sign up on his email list at nierfelder.com, and you'll get the skinny on when it's coming out. You can also hit him up on Facebook and Instagram. And he is also available for sessions. He is a – I will just say this. Three or four people turned me on to Nier, and every one of them said that he's an amazing jazz player. I mean, so you're well regarded by your peers. Um, so he's available for sessions. He's also touring right now with Keon Harold, who's a trumpeter. Support Nier on tour. They're going to be touring, I think, Europe soon. Yeah, we're going back to Europe again in a couple of weeks. Yep. Awesome. We're at the so, Blue Note next week. Oh, they're at the Blue Note next week. So if you happen to see, I think we'll come out after this episode will come out afterwards. But if you see Nier on tour, go say hello to him. Tell him you heard his interview on the show and uh, how much you liked it and uh, what a cool dude he is. And be present and open in the moment when he's at when you're at his show. For goodness <laughs> sakes. Uh, that's it, man. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Any, uh, All fi- right, thanks for having me, man. Final words of wisdom. No, man. I just just ha- go out there and have fun. That's great. That's very good words of wisdom. Hey, uh, thanks for everything. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again to Nier Felder for spending time with us. I really appreciate it. Go to nearfelder.com and support him and check him out on tour and, and, and get his new release when it comes out. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com, get on our mailing list and get notified of future episodes along with some early product announcements and cool things we have going on. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love. Nier, thanks again. And uh, I'm out. 
We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.